A very uh, good morning uh, to all the attendees, uh, esteemed faculty, uh, research aspirants, scholars, and students who have joined us today. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this one day international workshop on English language teaching and learning organized by the Department of English and other foreign languages, uh, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram campus, Chennai. We have in our midst today uh, Dr. Dwight Atkinson, Professor of English from the University of Arizona, USA, who is going to deliver an enlightening lecture presentation on the topic Ecological Second Language Teaching and Learning and interact with the participants thereafter. So, so please stay tuned. Before we move on to the welcome address, I would like to gently remind all the participants who have joined us today uh, to stay with us till the end of the session to access the feedback and uh, don't forget to post your queries, if any, in the live chat stream on YouTube uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, and make sure you can uh, you interact with the with our resource person as well. Uh, I would now like to call upon Dr. Ramma, Professor and Head Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, uh, to deliver the welcome address to the virtual gathering. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Walter. Thank to all, uh, the Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram campus, deems it a pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the international workshop on ecology in second language teaching and learning. And to present this extremely useful presentation, we have amidst us today, Dr. Dwight Atkinson, Professor of English, University of Arizona, United States of America. Let me join hands with all of you attendees to extend a very, very warm welcome and a hearty welcome to Professor Atkinson. SRM feels grateful, sir, to you for having accepted the invitation and being with us in spite of the time zone difference. Uh, it must be close to midnight by the time you complete the presentation. So thank you so much, Professor, and hearty welcome. I also welcome all the participants who have joined us today to gain insights about this topic. And without taking much of your time, I hand the forum over to my colleague, Asha Jennifer, for the introductory remarks. Over to you, Asha. I am Asha Jennifer, Assistant Professor English. I am so excited to be here to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Dr. Dwight Atkinson. He is no stranger to South India, especially Chennai. He has deep roots in India through his time spent in Madras Christian College. Professor Atkinson is an applied linguist and second language educator who currently works at the University of Arizona, where he is a professor of English and member of two graduate programs, English Applied Linguistics and Second Language Teaching and Learning. English language teaching is the area of research. Atkinson's research and teaching have ranged widely, including work in the following areas, non-mainstream approaches to second language learning, second language writing, theories to culture in applied linguistics, qualitative research methods, and education for first generation outcast learners in Indian universities and colleges. He has contributed scholarly articles on various topics in many reputed journals. He, he has published so many research articles, to name a few, his recent publications that have appeared in the modern language journal, language teaching, the journal of second language writing, and the handbook of second and foreign language writing. We have amidst us a renowned personality as our guest speaker today. Dear participants, please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Dwight Atkinson. Sir, the forum is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint here. It, uh, is this visible for everyone? Yes. Oh, great. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and I thank you so much, the organizing committee, 
Dr. Rama, the HOD, Dr. Walter, and your excellent technical skills, Dr. Mitali, for your warm welcome and your organizational skills, and Professor Asha for making the contact and guiding me uh, through the uh, process of being able to join you here today. Uh, I am so happy to uh, be back in uh, South India, uh, even virtually, where I spent two happy years uh, doing research in uh, the beautiful um, envir environment of MCC. So thank you again for the kind invitation. So my talk today will be about second language learning and teaching, not just English language teaching, although that's certainly one of my areas, but second uh, language learning and teaching from an ecological perspective. And I would like to organize my talk into four parts. A little bit like a play by Shakespeare, maybe particularly Romeo and Juliet. The, uh, I will begin with a prologue. I'll then have not act one, but scene one, a scene of English language learning. I'll then uh, have an interlude that is a pause in which I'll talk about the theory behind the uh, analysis and understanding of second language learning and teaching that I'm trying to communicate to you. Then we'll have a second scene of English language teaching in particular, and then I'll conclude uh, my presentation. So let me begin. The prologue. Usually when we talk about second language teaching and learning, we don't actually talk about big picture worldviews, uh, different ways of thinking about the nature of human being and existence. What we, uh, but in this presentation, I'd like to introduce and discuss two worldviews, largely in terms of their contrasting nature. The first I'm going to call the psychological worldview, and the second, the ecological worldview. The psychological worldview, as uh, you see represented here in the picture, is the idea that human existence or the center of human existence and the essence of being human is what is going on in our heads, okay? That we are individuals with individual psychology and everything else is what's happening outside us and around us, but the center of human existence. And this view has a long history, as you will know, in the Western world, uh, is within the individual psyche, the individual soul or the individual head. So you see this as far back as uh, Plato in uh, Western uh, uh, philosophy, uh, it comes forward to uh, the, the beginnings of modern philosophy in Descartes' foundational statement, I think, therefore I am. And you see it again in 20th century, what's now called cognitivism, the cognitivism of the cognitive revolution, uh, cognitive uh, psychology, and these days in the 21st century, especially cognitive science. And I would like to contrast that view very strongly with an ecological worldview of human existence in which we see uh, individuals, but not as isolated uh, cognitive or uh, psychological spaces, but rather in their total environment in relation to all of the other creatures features, uh, entities, processes that 
are taking place in the world around them, okay? And so learning, uh, which is my focus today in these two worldviews is quite a different thing. Learning in the psychological worldview is basically some kind of internal cognitive uh, action happening in this space and allowing the cognitive uh, machinery, let us say, to process and to build knowledge and organized systems of knowledge, including a language, a second language, a first language, a second language, etc. Whereas in the ecological view, uh, the learning is not storing away some kind of uh, representation, knowledge representation in an isolated cognitive space, but rather is in strengthening and building relationships between the individual and the individual's environment. In order to live in this world, one must know how to integrate with it, to participate in it, to make common cause with it, to survive in it. Uh, and that basically is the ecological uh, 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 um, definition of learning. It's learning how to adapt to, integrate with, and live in a ecological relationship with your environment. All right, so that's the prologue. Let's then move on to scene one. So I'd like to show you a scene of language learning, as we'll later uh, try to explain the language learning part of it. But the first uh, part I want to show to you, the first thing I'd like to focus on is the ecological um, nature of the scene, okay? So what I would like to do at this moment is to show you a series of about six or seven pictures, or I should say parts of a, pic a single picture, different parts of a single picture, and I'd like you to tell me what you see, okay? Uh, those of you who I have a direct uh, line with at the moment, and I'm going to ask you three basic questions, and I would like you for each picture, and I would like you to just tell me whatever answer comes into your mind off the top of your head, all right? So here's the first picture, um, and I would like to ask you questions. If you will unmute your microphone quickly and give me any answer that comes to your mind, I'd be very happy. Uh, let's see how this works. So the first question is, who is she? Could anybody unmute their mic and give me an answer, or is this not going to be possible? Hello? Dr. Walter? Yes, uh, is it possible? I just me? adding uh, the others also, Maithili ma'am and Asha ma'am. You Let can unmute your, uh, you can unmute your mics, uh, Asha ma'am and Maithili ma'am. You can unmute your mics as well. Are we ready? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm also. Uh, I'm waiting for uh, for them to unmute their mics. Okay. Am I am I audible to you? Uh, you're completely audible. Yeah. Yes. So we are getting a a, a few replies. A young okay. woman. A Good. young woman. Uh, uh, women. It represents women in general. Uh, okay. Just a couple of replays so far. Great. Great. Um, 
maybe I can just get you and the immediate uh, respondent who I have to answer so I can go a bit more quickly. Um, my next question is, where is she? Just off the top of your head, and you can uh, answer Dr. Walker if you don't mind. All right. Are you will you be changing the slides or is it the same slide? I have three questions. I think what we'll do is you can stop uh, you can stop this. I'll answer the questions myself since this is going to take too much time. Okay. So you can turn off, you can mute yours, and I'll just I'll go ahead and do it all. Okay. Thank you. So Maitali ma'am, do you have anything to add? Kindly, uh, kindly mute your mic, please. Uh, it's a, kindly uh, mute your mics, please. Okay. I see a woman over there. Okay. Kindly mute your mic. All right. Okay. So I guess this won't work exactly how I was planning to do it, but here, uh, okay, who is she? She's a young uh, woman. Uh, what is she doing? Uh, where is she? We don't know. Uh, what is she doing? Uh, maybe she's reading or maybe she's studying. All right, so that's the first picture. The second picture, a little more detail. Um, who is she? Uh, well, she looks like a young woman. Maybe may, she may be some uh, from uh, East Asia or have some background in East Asian uh, a family with that kind of background. Uh, maybe she's in a, a restaurant or a bar uh, that might be a bottle of, of wine or something. All right. Um, the next and uh, where is she? Uh, yes. What is she doing? Well, again, we don't know. If she's sitting in a restaurant or a bar, maybe she's eating dinner, all right? Okay, third picture. Uh, who is she? Uh, she's a young uh, woman, uh, perhaps of Asian background. Uh, she seems to be holding an egg in her hand. Perhaps she's preparing breakfast. Uh, where? Maybe in her kitchen. Oh, uh, uh, and what's she doing? We answered that question. All right, a larger picture. All right, who is she? She's a young woman. Okay, maybe a young woman cook, a person who's cooking at the moment. Uh, where is she? Again, perhaps in a kitchen. Okay, and what's she doing? She looks like she's about to break an egg and, and maybe cook something. Okay, maybe she's reading a recipe as she prepares to do so, all right? Let's look at the next picture. All right, so who is she? Well, she seems to be someone uh, who perhaps a young woman who's cooking something. Uh, she has a companion with her and they seem to be looking in the same direction. Maybe they're reading uh, a recipe or, or, or watching TV or something. Um, and uh, where is she? Again, maybe in a kitchen or someone, uh, someone's apartment. Uh, what, is, what is she doing? Again, she's cooking, right? And finally, this is the full picture. Who is she? Uh, she looks like a young woman who is preparing to break an egg, uh, perhaps to add to some kind of a uh, mixture uh, of ingredients uh, and uh, that perhaps uh, is related, probably related to the other items, the other ingredients on the table. Where is she? She looks like she's in an apartment somewhere. Um, what's she doing? Well, we just talked about that. She's cooking. All right. So those are possible answers to this Question, let me now give you a little bit more information. Okay, uh, in fact, she is a Japanese college student uh, who is 
doing a study abroad program in Finland, uh, a 10 month study abroad program uh, in Finland. Uh, she is a uh, studying um, furniture design and she is uh, sitting here with her classmate, a young Finnish man, and the language in which they communicate is English. When she arrived in Finland about eight months ago, uh, her English was quite basic. Um, she had some comprehension level, but not much fluency at all. She has not been taking English language classes in Finland. She's been studying other things, but she has been spending almost all of her waking hours with a small group of international and Finnish students who communicate in English. So as we'll see, her English is somewhat uh, uh, proficient at this point. Anything else I want to add? Yes. So this, I'm going to show you a video, a clip of what is happening here in this scene. The main activity is in fact, as we guessed, uh, uh, making uh, a recipe, a recipe uh, for cinnamon rolls, a kind of pastry which they're going to make a dough for and then bake and uh, serve to their friends. And the ingredients on the table are the ingredients uh, for the recipe, including here a box of eggs. Okay. And on the box of eggs, and what which is the uh, topic of their conversation, is a cartoon of a chicken playing tennis. Okay. So their main activity is to make the cinnamon rolls. But in this clip that I'm going to show you, for the moment, they're talking about the picture on the box of eggs that you see here. One egg. I bought this egg for Kangi. She wants this baguette, she said. This baguette is very cute. Nice color. Nice color. The bird playing tennis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it says here that it's. Uh, that it's not those big chicken houses mm. where a lot of cages that they cage uh, chickens have a place where they can do stuff. Work around. Yeah, and some dirt which they can. Mm, okay. And something they can. Okay, <laughs> free to work and free. That's, yeah. that's why they keep playing tennis. Yeah. That's the reason. Okay. So. This is ecological, not ecological. Uh, not ecological, but. But good. For yeah, chicken. Fair, fair of chicken. And one egg. Great. So, um, this is what they're doing. They're making a little story or an account about the, the picture of the chicken on the egg carton. And let me return in the next part of my talk to exactly how and uh, what kind of learning is going on here. But for the moment, I want to reinforce the first point, which is that this is an ecological situation. It's an ecology that is made up of um, a person, a person's head, a person's brain and body existing in an environment with other objects in the world which she is uh, using and interacting with and other human being uh, human artifacts such as a recipe on the side of a flower bag that's what he's reading on a uh, in a uh, structured space a humanly structured space a table with some uh, various devices and ingredients on it. Um, and let's now let's now zoom out a little bit in an apartment in an apartment building on a late winter day in 
a small city in the nation of Finland. They're actually somewhere around here. Okay. Uh, in an ecological or biological region, which is sometimes called Kalevala, okay, up here, okay, in the Scandinavian north, on a very uh, fragile, endangered, and precious planet, the Earth, in a hopefully slightly less endangered solar system, of planets around the sun in a galaxy called the Milky Way. So just wanting to uh, reinforce for you the first ecological principle, the principle which I am going to claim is underlying second language learning from an ecological perspective that everything's connected to everything. All right, so that's the end of the first scene. Now for the interlude, and this is going to be a little bit of the theory of language learning, the ecological approach to language learning and teaching that I am trying to, uh, to share with you today. So in the field of second language acquisition and teaching, in which I am a specialist, uh, we have a standard sort of traditional mainstream approach to how people learn second languages. And it goes like this. So there's some kind of input, some kind of linguistic stimulus or language material. We could even call it language data, which is floating around in the world when people use second languages, and this language material, some of it anyway, gets, gets input into uh, the second language learner uh, through uh, their senses, their ears or their eyes, etc. okay? And once it is input, so once the learner gets some kind of linguistic knowledge for their a brain to work on, okay, um, it undergoes a, a processing activities um, that is the, the brain or uh, cognition or mind turns the fairly random input that it takes in into a kind of structured system of knowledge, a language system, and that this language system, or sometimes called by my colleague Noam Chomsky, the I language or interlanguage, uh, sorry, internal language, or the linguistic competence, is basically the language uh, knowledge that people have uh, to use to do whatever they do with language. So language is what is processed and turned into a linguistic system in the mind or brain. And then on the basis of that system, that internal representation of language, people can do things in the world. They can uh, understand others or they can produce speech and have conversations, etc. So this is the sort of standard traditional basic approach or theory of how people learn second languages that's common in my field. Um, so to put it in terms of our learner, the young Japanese college student we saw earlier, we could say that she gets some input, she hears some language or reads some language, second language, and then her brain, which is actually not a flesh and blood brain, well, it is, but it acts basically as a computer, a uh, processor of information, okay? That information processor takes the input, 
and it processes it through a system, an internal processing system, which includes many of the uh, hypothesized uh, sort of units that you see here, um, and that the language through this process um, is basically turned into a linguistic system, which the uh, user then uses to do various things in the environment to understand others who are talking to her or uh, words she's reading and to uh, produce speech, to have conversations, etc., with other people. All right. So that's the mainstream traditional approach, which I'd now like to contrast with the one that I'm promoting here and trying to uh, explain to you today, a, a non-traditional, fairly radical and unusual approach in my field, um, although it does exist, of an ecological, not a psychological, but an ecological approach to language learning. And please recall the uh, first principle of, uh, an e of ecology, um, an ecological worldview, is that everything is connected to everything. So in this theory of second language learning, it's not about isolating knowledge in your head, but rather it's about making connections and using and strengthening connections to the rest of the world. So here are just a few of the connections that we can see in this ecology. There are connections. There is a strong connection, a bi-directional connection between uh, the young woman's head and the young man's head. Okay. Uh, likewise, and most uh, just as importantly, there is a connection between their bodies. After all, their uh, heads are attached to their bodies um, and, in fact, uh, are uh, used to guide them. Um, and they, their bodies are also connected to each other. They're sitting in the same space doing a very human form of coordinated action, in this case, cooking. Uh, there are connections between, for example, the um, young woman's mind and uh, perception, her, her sight, and the recipe that's on the back of the flour um, package. Uh, she does not read Finnish. The recipe is in Finnish, but she does, uh, she is able to read numbers, and there are some numbers there, so she could be confirming in this picture, uh, something that the young man has just said. There's also a relationship, a very important ecological relationship between the young man's cognition and uh, perception and the uh, flower uh, recipe on the flower package, which he's holding in his hand, another kind of very important relation. Um, and basically everything And this environment is connected to each other, interacting with each other, and in principle, at least, also interacting or supporting or promoting or structuring the process of second language learning. All right. So it's not the action of an isolated head separating knowledge from the world and internalizing it. It's the action of a total environment in which the actors in the environment are part of the environment and are learning in relation to the total environment. So as a way of summarizing and also giving a little more information, let's just ask about what's going on in their heads. Uh, head, the head, the brain, cognition are, is a, obviously a very important part of language uh, learning and teaching. So what is exactly the nature of cognition in each of these theories? Well, in the uh, psychological cognitive processing theory, 
obviously the brain is in the head and the brain is a computer. It's a data processor and it's uh, taking in language uh, 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 stimuli and processing them into a linguistic system. So the action here, the learning action is going on rather uh, exclusively or certainly very substantially, the center of the action is the isolated cognitive computer. Okay? And it is not really a part of the environment. It is its own environment and its own system. In the ecological approach, on the other hand, yes, certainly uh, the actors do have brains, okay? Um, but the brains are not isolated in the head and they're not primarily uh, devoted to storing away, isolating, um, um, internalizing knowledge in the head, but rather they're making connections with the rest of the world. They are bringing the body and the head into better ecological relationship with the total environment. All right, so now let me go back, take a step back and talk to you about learning in the video that I showed you before of these two people having a conversation about the uh, package of eggs, the egg carton that is sitting in front of them and from which uh, the young woman has taken an egg. And please remember, I wish I had a good picture of this, but on the egg carton, there's a picture of a chicken, a cartoon of a chicken playing tennis, which it appears is supposed to represent that these, bird, uh, these chickens are not cage-raised chickens, but rather they're running around freely, so the eggs are supposed to be healthier um, and the chickens are supposed to be happier. So here now, let's look at a bit of the linguistic interaction between the young woman and the young man over the uh, egg carton in, in, as they describe what they see on the egg carton. And there's actually a lot of other things going on here. Uh, there's gesture, there's body positioning, there's tone of voice, there's uh, movement, uh, closeness, and uh, separation between the two people as they handle various, um, uh, various kinds of tools and uh, objects in the environment. Um, so they're not just talking. This is not just about language acquisition, but for the moment, or language use, but for the moment, let's just focus on the language, okay? So in the first line, uh, the young woman, who we'll call Rie, says, I bought this egg for Huggy. Huggy is a friend of theirs, a mutual friend. She wants this package, she said. In this package is very cute. And uh, the young man, who we'll call Yako, says, nice color. Okay, so he's asking her to specify why it's cute. She says, nice color. So she repeats his um, sort of prompt and she adds, nice color and that bird playing tennis. Okay. And he says, yeah. And then he starts to read uh, the message uh, on the egg package. He says, it says here that it's not those big chicken houses where there's lots of cages that they, uh, chickens have place where they can do stuff, do stuff, right? And she takes the do stuff and says, walk around, okay. And he says, yeah, um, some dirt which they can, and then he starts to do some gestures. He starts to uh, uh, l do a sort of scratching gesture like a chicken might do in the dirt. And then he imitates a chicken Pecking. Maybe he doesn't know these words. They're not very high freq frequency words in, in English. And she goes, ah, oh, free to walk. And she starts moving her fingers around free to walk and free to, that's why she's playing tennis. And he says, yeah, that's the reason. And she says, okay, it. He says, so, all right. She says, it is ecological, not ecological. 
and he says, no, not ecological. He says, not ecological, but, and then she takes over, adds to his uh, first part of his utterance. Uh, he says, he says, not ecological, but, and she says, but good for chicken. And he says, better for chicken. Okay. And that's the conversation they have together. They tell a little story. Okay. And this in an ecological viewpoint is a form of learning. It's a form of learning because she is enabled to do something that she couldn't do by herself, which is to tell a story, to put a lot of language together into a coherent, um, uh, unified, um, uh, topically appropriate and relevant um, account of something in her environment. She couldn't do it alone. We can, I guess you have to sort of trust uh, based on this, uh, but she can do it with the aid of a more proficient uh, companion or cooperator, okay? Um, she is performing, and we would say this is what learning is. She's performing more adequately and more in a more sophisticated way in relation to her environment, and in this case, describing uh, a feature in her environment than she could do alone. So she's learning through a process of co-constructing a story. And, you know, if we want to reconstruct the story, sort of what she's been able to do, what they've been able to do together that she couldn't do alone, it's something like this. This is just a reconstruction, doesn't have all the words. But I bought this egg package for our friend Hagi because it's very cute. It's a nice color and the chicken pictured on it is playing tennis. This is because the chickens producing these eggs are not kept in big chicken houses with lots of cages, but instead can walk around playing in the dirt and pecking freely. This is not especially ecological, but it's better for the chickens. So here she has performed a linguistic activity with some help from another part of the ecology, which allows her to participate more ecologically, more adaptively in the action in which she's engaged, linguistic action in which she's engaged. All right, that is the end of the interlude. Let us now move to a second scene, scene two, and I uh, would like to begin again, sort of in the ultimate uh, uh, ecology, uh, ecological situation in which we exist, the uh, galaxy of the Milky Way, in which our solar system is located, in which our fragile and much endangered Earth is located into a part of the Earth, which in national terms is called Australia, and is made up uh, bioregionally by a number of different geographical, uh, clima clim climactic, um, and uh, 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 regions. And from there into the city of Sydney, Australia, and a suburb, suburb of uh, Sydney, in which there is a church and into the church then, into a, uh, a room in the church in which one of the uh, administrators in the church, whose name is John Bartik, an Australian, is conducting an English language class with a group of Mandarin-speaking students who are at a very basic level and uh, who he has just started teaching and is asking or prompting with a number of questions. So his first question to them was, do you like my jacket? And then he held out the jacket he was wearing. And now 
he's uh, and 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 then he changed the word to from a jacket to blazer so now he's just finishing off that second question and he's going to ask them a third question in which they will answer and he will get them to repeat and uh, ask him and answer his question uh, um, uh, as you'll see. Um, so he's about to ask them the question, do you like my haircut? And we will see that perhaps the students have a little trouble understanding the word uh, even though he makes a gesture to his head. But let's watch and then we'll talk about the ecological nature of teaching and learning in this environment. <laughs> do you like my haircut? Do you like my haircut? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like your haircut. Do you like my haircut? Yes, I like. I like you. Your haircut. Your haircut. Good. Good. I like your haircut. I like. I like your haircut. Your haircut. You don't. You don't like your haircut. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't like your haircut. I don't like your haircut. Good. Good. Do you like my haircut? I don't like your haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like my haircut? Yeah, I like your haircut. Okay, now change. I, I, don't, I don't like your haircut. Okay, good, good, good. Do you like my haircut? <laughs> okay. So here's just a little bit of what's going on in what we would like to claim as a very uh, complex and highly interactive uh, ecology, uh, a social ecology um, of a teacher teaching uh, English at a basic level. So let's see exactly, uh, let, let me say generally that uh, what we would like to show here is a number of different uh, connections uh, between the teacher, the students, the environment, uh, the fact that they're standing rather than sitting, uh, their location in the church, uh, etc. Okay, uh, the way they use their bodies um, and the way they use each other as sources of environmental information. Okay, so we want to look about, we want to look at how language circulates uh, and is integrated in the various interactions in this environment. Okay, so John's, uh, prior to the pictures you see here, uh, John, the teacher, has asked the whole group, do you like my haircut? And the uh, whole group has laughed. We're not sure why, but perhaps partly because they don't really understand the question. He puts his hand to his head in the um, immediately preceding uh, uh, proceedings, uh, and he says, do you like my haircut? But they don't understand. Perhaps, anyway, they laugh, and then he starts to ask individual students, do you like my haircut? So in the first picture here, he asks a student who's off screen, do you like my hair haircut? He doesn't get any answer. This is his third time. His first time he asks the whole group. The second time he asks the person here. And then he asks this student. He says, do you like my haircut? She pauses for a moment and then uh, says, yeah, as she nods her he head, okay? That's what happens. And then uh, let me just 
uh, flash forward a little bit. At that point, John uh, does a little acting. He leans to his uh, left and he goes, that is, I'm so glad somebody answered my question correctly and they like my haircut. Now, at the same time as this student uh, answers, uh, yeah, okay, um, this student starts speaking as well. And she says, cut, okay. She's uh, directing it to John, but John doesn't uh, respond, okay. Um, and, and this is then where John goes, okay, sorry. Um, I should have pointed this out earlier. So he's making a joke and people are laughing, but she's not smiling. She's trying to find out it appears what the word cut means uh, and, uh, through trying to connect to the main primary source of information in the environment, that is the teacher, but he starts moving down the line and asking other students, do you like my haircut? Okay. What does she do? Well, not having been successful in getting uh, information through her main connection, she asks other, she makes a connection with other students in the environment. She does a sort of hand gesture to catch their attention, and then she says, cut. Okay, cut. Okay, she says it quietly. That's uh, why, uh, very quietly, that's why we have the parentheses around it. In fact, we can't hear her, but we can see her mouth moving. Okay. And this woman, who you can hardly see here, um, says something in Chinese, which we can't hear. And then all, th and then she puts her hand to her head, and all three women then uh, put their hands to their head, and they start moving their hands around, uh, presumably uh, indicating what the word cut or haircut means. Um, after that, I don't have pictures for it, but, but she had quite a concerned look on her face, but afterwards uh, that she uh, returned to her position uh, with a smile on her face and again looking at the teacher. And then the teacher comes back and he's asking some other people the question, uh, do you like my haircut? And then as he moves uh, past her, um, she steps forward and she says, I don't, I don't like your haircut. Okay. And then he turns to her um, and he says, good. Okay. And then uh, he starts to say, uh, say, I don't like your haircut. And she sort of interrupts him and she says, sort of explaining why she says very long. Okay. And he says, uh, say, I don't like your haircut. And then here she repeats one more time with a great big smile on her face. I don't like your haircut. Okay. So what has happened here is uh, she has gone from um, not knowing a word uh, that John has used, a keyword, right? She said, cut, cut cut. She's got some information from somewhere else in her environment. And then a moment later, she has got the word and she's added a phrase. They have been studying, do you like? Yes, I like, but they have not studied this um, construction. I don't like. Um, she uh, obviously knows it. So she says, I don't like your haircut. And then, and then, she, so she's putting it into the environment. And what's very interesting then is that John picks it up and then starts asking other students, um, uh, do you like my haircut? And then signaling for them to say no, basically. So let's watch one more time. So again, what we're looking for is the flow of information and language <clears throat> in this ecology, not simply coming from the teacher but as a function of the whole ecology. Do you like my haircut? <laughs> Do you 
you like my haircut? Do you like my haircut? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 you like my haircut? I like your haircut. Do you like my haircut? So what we see here is not teaching from the top down. It's not simply knowledge being transferred or transmitted from the teacher to the student. We see teaching as a function, teaching and learning as a function of the whole ecology. He asks, they answer, they propose, they change, they uh, inject back into the environment some kind of knowledge and in fact, uh, the learning and teaching, we would argue, is a function of the whole environment, the whole interacting environment. All right, uh, let me then quickly conclude. Um, today I've tried to uh, present to you a viewpoint on language learning and teaching, which is quite at uh, variance, quite different than the uh, sort of mainstream uh, dominant one in which the brain acts as a computer which uh, creates uh, isolated uh, uh, representations apart from the world and the environment. Um, but the view that I've been uh, supporting and trying to explain to you a little bit is one in which we see a total integration of knowledge, uh, creation, integration, and um, uh, uh, um, uh, learning and teaching as a function of the total environment uh, in which everyone and everything in the environment is playing a part. And this is the ecological uh, approach, the ecological approach to second language learning and teaching. All right, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, this went a little long. I am just going to go turn off my air conditioner because it's making noise, and then I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, you can return to your browser. Okay. Now, uh, I kindly request the, the participants to post your queries, if any, in the in the live chat stream on YouTube. Sir, uh, as a as a start off to this uh, to the to the Q and A interaction. Uh, let me just uh, let me just put to you a few comments which were posted earlier uh, by the participants uh, in the form of a question, if I may. Uh, uh, the, if you, you're talking about language learning in a in an ecological perspective, uh, what would you say are the most important? Uh, if you and 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 considering you have a classroom interaction or uh, in the, in an educational institute and if you if you have uh, what uh, what would you consider the most important uh, pedagogical principles if you're talking about uh, uh, ecologically uh, valid uh, contexts 
uh, of uh, in a in a language uh, teaching environment so right. what would you say are the most important ones in your opinion thank you it's a wonderful question i would uh, rather than advocating for some particular kind of method i would advocate for a principle of maximum interactivity in the classroom whatever the teacher and students can do to promote this kind of rich ecological action so that you saw, um, even in a beginner's language classroom uh, in the second scene or the kind of um, active uh, integrative activity that you saw in the first scene wasn't a classroom but it was a learning situation any in any way uh, to create those kinds of situations uh, in which people are active unafraid eager enjoying um i believe okay. will help will help uh, the learners to to learn to relate to their environment uh, more profitably more efficiently and more adaptively Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So apart from uh, 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 relationships, uh, do you think the identity of a person is also important in such an approach? Great. That's another great question. Um, you know, identity, uh, some some approaches to identity look at it as something internal or individual to the self. I would say identity, like other ecological relations, is a relation. It is a, it is a connection with the world. It is how the world uh, sees you and how you see the world in relation to yourself. So I think this is absolutely central to language learning and language teaching is that the students, the learners, uh, are able to uh, build, maintain, and interactively construct and sort of perform their identity in the uh, classroom or other language learning situations. So yes, absolutely. I, I didn't focus on it, but the learner's identity, which is partly a function of the interaction here, um, for example, in the first scene, the young lady was being, uh, was having an identity built as a competent language user, somebody who can tell a story with the assistance, with some assistance by the other. So that's, that's a, an identity as a su successful language learner. And I think ecology supports uh, that kind of view. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the third question is uh, uh, by one of the participants which was posted earlier uh -huh. uh, in the chat stream was, uh, do you think that in, in such an ecological approach to language learning, uh, the theory and practice are, uh, you know, are uh, almost the same or, or do you think that they are constantly changing or are they absolute? Great. Let me think. Let me think just a little bit about that. Um, well, I think the principle uh, is, I don't want to say absolute, um, but the principle is, is strong and the principle is fundamental to the viewpoint. Um, we learn to live and survive in the world through interacting with the world, through integrating yes. with the world, uh, and um, not isolating knowledge in a isolated cognitive computer. So in that sense, certainly the practice and the theory are, are absolute. I mean, this is, this is the proposition here. This is the way it works. Um, but of course, adapting, adaptation is, we are constantly adapting to a dynamic changing environment. So it's a little bit hard to say, you know, students should learn this for all time. Language changes, uh, 
people uh, change in their social uh, activities and their social habits. So the principle is the same, but the practice, you know, probably 50 years ago, you wouldn't teach the same kinds of things uh, in the classroom that you do now because the ecology, the uh, learning and teaching and languages and ecology are different. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of our uh, participants, have, uh, Kavita, has asked, uh, uh, is this interrelated to the affect theory, uh, uh, which, you know, uh, seeks to organize affects sometimes used uh, interchangeably with emotions or subjectively experienced feelings? Uh, is this related, interrelated with that? Uh, thank you, Kavita. That's a, that's an, a very interesting question and something I'd like to talk about. Um, one's relationship with one's environment, one's ecological environment, is a, a total relationship. It involves all aspects of human feeling, thinking, um, being, uh, embodiment, um, and emotion is obviously, or affect, is obviously a very uh, central part of that that in interaction. Uh, in this view, everything is connected to everything. So cognition and emotion are not separate things. In fact, one of the arguments is you can't have cognition without emotion, without affect, because the first thing a organism does in an environment is to evaluate their chances of survival, success, comfort, uh, learning potential in an environment. So uh, certainly affect is at the base, is basic to an ecological view. I hope that answers in a short way your question. Thank you, sir. Sir, our faculty coordinator, uh, Ms. Asha Jennifer, has asked, what are the ecological challenges in second language teaching and learning? It's a great question. Thank you, Professor Asha. I think, uh, let me talk about two or three different challenges. One is to create a classroom environment, if we're talking about classroom learning, in which this principle of, of connectivity is honored and uh, sort of uh, uh, promoted. Um, there are many forms of second language teaching which basically tell the teacher, kind of give the teacher a recipe for how to put knowledge into students' heads. Uh, I'm hoping to ar be arguing, I hope you can see that I'm arguing against that kind of a view. Um, you might say that what I'm arguing for is a kind of a communicative approach to language teaching, but I see communication as a much wider phenomenon than just two people communicating together. I see it as two people or more acting together to perform some kind of action in the world uh, to which uh, 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 is a response uh, and an action on response to and an action on the environment. So that just for example, uh, let's say uh, a course an, an ELT course based on doing something active and real in the world like cooking might be uh, more interactively e and ecologically valid than a course which basically has to do with uh, grammar instruction and memorizing grammar. I'm certainly not against grammar instruction, but I think the more you contextualize it and make it uh, functional and authentic the better off you are. Now, I said I'd mention a couple of other points, but honestly, I can't quite remember what they were. So I hope that's a uh, first okay. part of the answer. Thank you so much, sir. The next question is on your screen, sir, by Aditi. Uh, could you throw some light on common ecological principles that would hold true in all ecological situations? Uh, thank you, Aditi, for the question. Um, I will always return to the basic um, principle. And let me sort of, sort of put it in a contrastive form, right? So we typically think of language learning as the extraction of some kind of knowledge. Uh, 
uh, language from the environment and the isolation and installation of language in the head. Our, our common view is that we are a bunch of heads that have a bunch of knowledge in them and that that's the that's where language a second language knowledge exists and resides in an isolated head which is apart from not a part of the environment okay an ecological view where the first principle the most important principle will always be uh, 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 uh integration connection um uh Co, co construction cooperation uh, uh, of an e in an ecological system, relationality in an ecological system. In that view, there's no head. There's no separate head. The head is on the body, and the body, the body is in the world. And the purpose of our cognition is to help us to get along in, survive in, and prosper in that world. So. Uh, I don't know if this is a practical answer to your question, but the first principle is the practice, uh, is the guide to the practice uh, of teaching and learning in this. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I think that also uh, uh, would answer the, the final question, which is by uh, Surendran, instead of ecological approach, can we call it connectedness approach? I think you have uh, answered that uh, as well uh, with your. Would you like to add anything, sir, to this uh, as an answer to this question? Would you like to add anything, or shall we end the interaction session? Sure, I will add a point or two. Um, yes, I would say connectedness, integrativeness, co functionality are all sort of wrapped up, embedded in this idea of ecology, okay? Um, there are a few terms that are used in my field. Uh, one of them is uh, connectionism, which is actually a form of a, a computer modeling of cognition, which I, I would say doesn't have a direct relationship with what we're talking about exactly. And there's a, there's a term used, I think it's used in business studies, uh, connectedness theory or something. Uh, which I'm not very familiar with, but here we're talking about ecology, um, ecological functioning, um, the integration of all aspects of the environment uh, together. Yeah, so that's that's what I would say. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the uh, the, the interactive Q and A session. Uh, I would like to ask uh, our HOD, Dr. Rama, to say a few words. Ma'am, over to you. Yes. Uh, yes, Walt. Uh, so uh, I, I want to just add a few things to what Professor Dwight was saying. Not add, just uh, give uh, perspective to it. I think uh, in a class where we have mixed ability students, it is so difficult actually to uh, teach them English. Uh, so I can pretty well understand that if it is going to be a class where uh, Professor Dwight uh, showed us in the video, uh, the Mandarin uh, students who, uh, I mean, with a lot of difficulty had to understand what a basic uh, haircut, the word haircut itself was all about. I think the challenges are many and Professor Dwight has given us a very beautiful perspective to second language learning through uh, this ecological perspective that he said and i think he's answered the questions also uh, to a very great extent to make the uh, attendees today understand what uh, they are trying to actually uh, you know understand from this entire presentation and i'm sure all of you must have got a lot of insights about second language uh, learning and teaching from the ecological perspective so I would like to thank uh, Professor Dwight uh, immensely uh, on behalf of all of us, especially from uh, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram, for sparing his time and being with us and so patiently answering all the questions that have been uh, thrown forth by the attendees. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you ma'am. Uh, with that, we come to the to the uh, formal vote of thanks, and I would now like to request. Uh, Ms. Maithili, Assistant Professor, Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. 
you can unmute your mic ma'am I think Maitri ma'am is having some connectivity issues. Here we go. Uh, I, will I, just think, I, ask. Think I think it's buffering and, try, and she's trying to get back. Yes. Let's wait for a moment. Yes. Yes, Maitri ma'am, you, uh, you can go ahead. Yes. Thank you, thank you all the sir. Uh, and we have come to the end of the session, and all good things should come to an end. And I take this opportunity to thank all the people who have contributed to the situation of the people. Um, I thank God Almighty for blessing us with success in our every simple deed. On behalf of the management and the Department of English and other foreign languages, I express my profound gratitude to our speaker, Dr. Dwight Atkinson, Professor of English, University of Arizona for his intellectual deliberations and a productive session. I would like to extend my gratitude to the management for the continuous support in all our endeavors. I put on record my heartfelt thanks to our professor and head, Dr. Rema, for her constant guidance and encouragement. I'm deeply indebted to Dr. Walter, Assistant Professor of French, for rendering technical support today, and of course, whenever I needed any. My special Thanks goes to uh, goes out to my colleague Mrs. Asha for her commitment and contribution to the smooth conduct of the event. Finally, I thank all the participants. You are awesome. Without an engaged audience, no event can be successful. Thanks much for that and for your patience as well. We look forward to your continuous support. Thank you all. Stay safe and stay happy. Thank you, thank you, uh, Maitali. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Professor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful insight. Yes. Thank you. Shall we end the session, sir? Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Best thank you. Thank you, sir. Best wishes to you all. Good night, thank sir. You. Good night. Good night, sir. Yes. Good night. <laughs> good night. Can we take a leave, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can leave the studio now. As ever, thanks for well, the technical support you have provided. Thank you so much. Welcome, ma'am. My pleasure, ma'am. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Ma